Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, a podcast exploring the films of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel Thingwall, and joining me as always... Angie, hello. We are joined by a very special guest today, our old friend Mac, who listeners to I Hate Love Remakes might remember from the episodes on Last House on the Left and My Bloody Valentine. Hello, everyone. Welcome. As this is a Joel Schumacher podcast series, what is your personal history with the films of Joel Schumacher and your overall impressions of him as a filmmaker? I am one of that very large group that recognizes his name as being attached to the Batman flicks. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I went to his IMDb page and started looking through all the work he'd done and starting to realize, oh, wow, I've actually seen a lot of this stuff. And he's behind quite a few things that I didn't even realize. Yep. His is a career full of surprises. Mm, agreed. So what are your overall impressions of him as a director in terms of the ones that you have seen? Honestly, it's very hard to pin him down as far as I can say, because you look at something like Batman and Robin and you compare it to something like The Phantom of the Opera. I mean, it's obviously the same director given his name is attached to it, but there's incredibly different styles and incredibly different decisions made in terms of direction. Had you not been told or had you not paid attention to the fact he was the director, I honestly don't think you would have been able to tell. And had you seen any of his earlier work here from the 70s and early 80s? No, that was entirely new to me. Same to us. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So tonight we are going to be covering the TV movie Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, which debuted on NBC on January 8th of 1979. And the film is, again, written and directed by Joel Schumacher. And I don't know the origins of this, but, you know, we had just done the whole string of Motown movies with Sparkle and Car Wash and The Wiz. And I'm guessing this came out of it because this is, again, a Motown production. Mm -hmm. I noticed that. And I did look it up. Motown throughout the 70s did make several attempts to break into the country music market. Hmm. Interesting. They did not succeed. (laughs) (laughs) But like 1979 was like right in the middle of their third and final attempt. Okay. And the film was also, again, executive produced by Rob Cohen at Universal, the same guy who did The Wiz and has since gone on to direct Dragonheart and Stealth. (laughs) This was actually the very first film produced by Laura Schuler. Laura Schuler in later years would marry the director Richard Donner and go on by the name of Laura Schuler Donner. And to this day is one of the top producers in Hollywood. She is like the main spearhead of the entire X-Men franchise at Fox. Yeah, pretty much kind of always associate her name with those films for sure and helping them get made. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And some other stuff like Constantine, the Free Willy movies. (laughs) And we'll actually uh, hear her name again as she was the producer of Joel St. Elmo's Fire. No, okay. Other than that, I don't really have any production notes. All I know is that this obviously has ties to the previous Motown films and was the second of the two-part TV movie deal that also gave us Virginia Hill. Mm. But that was like five years ago. Right. I was trying to at least like look on Wikipedia because I always like to do that. And it was like, literally, it's a mention in Laura Schuler Donner's page. And that's about it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even have a page. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Like, okay, this is an obscure one. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing neither of you had ever seen this film before. No. Uh, definitely not, no. <laughs> no, same here. I'd never even heard of it until we started researching this project. Mm-hmm. Moving into synopsis, I don't have one. It's kind of in the title. Yeah, like Car Wash, <laughs> it's basically just a day-in-the-life ensemble movie of the Dixie Bar and Grill, a southern bar and grill, <laughs> probably in Dixie, we don't know. <laughs> Every Monday night hosts an amateur night for musicians, comedians, whatever acts. And this is just one of those Monday nights as all the various acts come, all their various lives intersect, and then they all leave at the end of the night. And I figure we'll just bring up each of the characters and acts as we get through them. All right. Oh, and then also there's apparently a serial mass shooter that never pays off. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, it's like almost exactly like Car Wash because Car Wash had the mad bomber. Yeah, the Coke bottle bomber. Yeah. Yeah. And then this one, like they keep mentioning it and then there's a guy who they think it is kind of and then it's not. I'm wondering what crazy killer on the loose DC cab will have. <laughs> The Joel Schumacher ensemble day in the life dramas, a little bit of a formula to them. Right, Not a bad two formula. for two so far, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then St. Elmo's Fire, there's this weird slasher movie going on in the background, probably. <laughs> Would be the right time for it. So Angie, do you recommend Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill? I probably said during Car Wash, I'm not as crazy about these kind of day in the life sort of things. You know, of course, one thing, it's hard to recommend a film that's incredibly hard to find, for one thing. I sort of feel about it, assuming it was actually aired on TV. If you could find it, if it was on, yeah, go ahead and check it out. It's got a really good cast, and I think they give some good performances. There's really not much of anything to the story that, oh yeah, this is something you have to find and you have to watch, but it's okay. Mac, do you recommend it? Actually, yeah, I would. I found it to be incredibly charming. But then again, I have a bit of a weakness for these day in the life sort of stories. So I might be a little biased in that way. But I found this entire thing quite charming. And all the characters... I don't necessarily want to say I found every single one of them compelling, but there was actual personality and it was just enjoyable to meet everyone and to see what was going on and to just see it all come together under this one roof of the talent show of the Dixie. And I recommend it too. It's clunky around the edges. I don't think it's directed as well as what Michael Schultz did with Car Wash, but I think it does a great job of using the location, using all these various characters. As Max said, it's charming. It's just got a really nice, rustic, like if you go to a venue for the evening, this is kind of like what it's going to be like if you just hang in the back and watch all the various people on stage and off. The music was good. I think some of the acts were good. I mean, a few of the plot threads were a little wobbly here and there, like we mentioned Mm -hmm. the disco killer. (laughs) But I thought it was really quite sweet and charming. And I will say that it's not impossible to track down. So I think it's a film that if you come across, yes, you should check it out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Why don't we just roll down through some of the characters? Let's start with Mac and Fanny, the couple who own the bar. Amateur Night was her idea, but Mac is hoping that he can use it as a springboard for his son to hit fame. And Mac is played by Victor French, who was a big character actor in the 70s, probably most prominent as he was born of the townsfolk in Little House on the Prairie. And then Fanny is Louise Latham, who was a Broadway actress who then transitioned into film with Hitchcock's Marnie. Hmm. Angie, what did you think of Mac and Fanny? a cute little dynamic, slightly predictable in ways of that couple that they complain about each other, but you know that really deep down they do like each other quite a lot and they think they do good things and help each other out in the ways that they may not be willing to do certain things themselves, particularly Mac. Both actors were enjoyable and I liked them. Mac, what did you think about Mac? (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to have to agree with Angie in that it was a little bit predictable, but the two of them were quite enjoyable to watch and just the way they played off each other. And one of the things that actually stood out to me about Mac (laughs) was that conversation he had with his son, the no values monologue, just that whole damn punk kids these days. (laughs) And it translated quite nicely to today in that whole freaking millennials and, you know. Yeah. So I found that to be well written simply because it is applicable and it's something I sat there and laughed at personally. But to bring it back around, yeah, I'm with Angie here. It was a little bit predictable, but they were actually quite sweet. Yeah, they're definitely archetypes. Mm -hmm. They're the patrons of the joint and they're also the parent figures to this entire group. They're the ones who are looking out for everyone as the night goes along. I thought they cast the two really well. They had a good chemistry. They both had this very rustic, trustworthy quality to them where it's like their place would feel like home if it was a regular place that you would go to every night. Mm. And I mean, again, we have that argument with the son and we should probably just go ahead and bring up their son, Roy, played by Dennis Quaid in one of his early roles, who's a talented musician, but he's gotten in trouble with cops for having joints. (laughs) Mac, yeah, you brought up the whole values discussion. What do you think of the payoff to that? Again, it was a little bit predictable in that you saw some of that coming, especially when you started seeing Roy interact with Sharon. You sort of saw from the distance the whole, oh, he's not such a bad guy after all, and he's actually making his parents pretty proud with the decisions he's making, that sort of thing. 
I agree. I actually was a little disappointed by it. I sort of felt like, I don't know why, just because he did a song with another performer, that automatically means he's more responsible or, you know what I mean? Like, it didn't really feel like a good payoff. I felt like maybe they either needed a little more of a discussion or something, whereas I felt like they were kind of just sort of wrapping it up very quickly because it was the end of the film. But, I mean, Dennis Quaid, when he first walked in, I swear my first thought was like, wow, he looks like Chris Pratt right here. Like a young Chris Pratt, that same kind of leading man type look, but also sort of your normal regular guy at the same time. So I thought that was really neat. But yeah, I was a little disappointed in their story overall. It didn't quite connect for me. See, and I liked it because, again, that payoff was he took this entire evening that was meant to be for him, Mm -hmm. and he literally gave up his spot on the stage to this woman who was having a hard time standing up in front of the spotlight. Mm -hmm. I thought there was a bit of sacrifice to that, that I think that's what the father recognized in terms of the values. I guess I don't really see what that has to do with smoking weed, but... (laughs) Right. Well, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like it all just was sort of mashed together. But no, it was fine. You have to remember back in the hippie era, (laughs) there was a lot more of a stigma against marijuana than there is today, mostly because all of the older people today were of the hippie era. Right, right. (laughs) And they lived good long lives because they smoked pot. (laughs) But I mean, it's like at the time, the moment you mention marijuana, it's like red flag. You've done a horrible thing. You're an addict. You're a junkie. You're going to go to jail. And and nowadays, it's like if your parents find out you have pot, it's going to be like, can I share it? (laughs) (laughs) The attitudes of pot have definitely changed, but I like that it's confronting that. What does that have to do with how good I am as a person? Because I smoke a few joints. Right. And one thing I should say is that, you know, we've had this going back to Sparkle is that I do think Schumacher is a very by the numbers storyteller. There's not a whole lot of unpredictability to his storylines, little moments here and there. Well, it's also, you know, he's still very early as far as doing his writing. So that makes perfect sense. For me, it's always, you know, I've never really had much of a problem with something being cliched as long as you still do it well. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think this is quite as sharp as it was in like Car Wash or even Sparkle to a degree, but it's still think he plays the notes well. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other thoughts, Mac, on Dennis Quaid in the role? I honestly found the moment he spent in the back hall with Sharon genuinely heartwarming. I thought that was a really moving little scene with his recognition of, yeah, this is hard for her. And yet this is what she wants to do and part of who she is. And him recognizing that, interacting with her, pushing her a little bit, but not in such a way that it made her uncomfortable. It was more an actual support and that connection there. Though I do love the little girl walking around the <laughs> corner and seeing them both and being like, he has replaced me. I will kill him in his sleep. It's like death glare. He was precious. <laughs> you said what you read from that, okay? <laughs> like, I'm supposed to be her comfort. <laughs> Mm-mm. But no, it's, and then Dennis Quaid is one of the most charming men alive. So. <laughs> it also helps, especially when he smiles. Yeah, agreed. And I was surprised. This was only like two years into his acting career. He had just gotten a bunch of big supporting roles like this, and literally the next film he did after this was the big Oscar film Breaking Away, which launched him mm. into mainstream success. Okay. So it's like this was literally right before he took off and became a major film star, mm. and then made Dreamscape. <laughs> Yeah, and then let's get to Sharon Singleton, who is the singer that he breaks out of her stage fright and her anxiety. And that is the legendary country singer Tanya Tucker. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Me neither. Yeah. So, Mac, what did you think about Sharon? I will not lie to you. I was essentially that back in university. I was in a classic choir and it was easy to just hide in the background. And dear God, the moment that they put me up front for a solo, I actually choked. So I really felt for her. I fortunately never had a moment where I choked on stage before, but I've certainly had a whole lot of stage fright in any like time I had to give a speech was just like uh, murder. So, yeah, I really related to her as well. I guess part of me goes like I wouldn't just get over it in a night. But I do think that the way that Roy was helping her both backstage and then in the beginning, how he sang with her a little bit. And just like watching her sit there and like sort of embrace it and like, oh, I love this. I'm doing what I really want to do. It was a satisfying end to see her come out of her shell like that and perform so well. 
It was great seeing the whole, she's the first one up and she has the stage fright, she leaves the stage. Mm -hmm. But then not only with Roy, but the bond between her and the little girl. Mm -hmm. And how the two of them, they don't really want to be there. (laughs) Or they do, but they don't want to be there in the ways that they are there and how they just become a support structure to each other. And then, yeah, with Roy, just gradually finding ways to ease her into it. Like even when they get up on stage, starting to lead into the song himself, Mm -hmm. killing the spotlights, all that Mm -hmm. stuff. It's a very different scene, but it played on the same level of that scene in Sparkle, where Styx was kind of easing Sparkle into that song that she couldn't figure out how to get into. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that's going to be one of the Schumacher hallmarks, is (laughs) easing people into things. (laughs) You know, there's that bit where Alfred eased Robin in... (laughs) Finding the connective threads already. Yeah. (laughs) Here's a question. Do you think she should have won the contest? No. Who would you have voted for? Oh, I can't remember her name. The larger lady who did the big medley. Mm Mm-hmm. I loved her performance. She, I thought she was the best. No, I'm definitely in agreement there. I actually would have voted for her, too. (laughs) I mean, Sharon was quite good up on the stage, but it was just that larger woman who had that presence and was just really enjoyable to watch and just a great performer. Mm -hmm. I actually agree, too. And the thing is, Sharon's song was great. She's a beautiful singer. But again, it was just a pretty typical country song. Yeah. Mm. I do like the shots around the stage is like everyone's just really getting into the song and all that. But yeah, then there was, well, let's go ahead and jump to the character of Very Elvira, who was played by Pat Ast, who I looked her up. Fascinating life. She was a singer and, and an actress. She was one of the first major plus size fashion models oh, okay. in the early 70s and still looking exactly as she does here. And then very quickly fell in with Andy Warhol and was part of his main mm-hmm. circle and did a lot of films and projects with him. Okay. And then continued acting up until the end of her life. And very interesting person. (laughs) And yeah, I like that backstage, you have no idea what her act is going to be. You have no idea what her performance is going to be just as she's getting all ready and all this stuff. And it's not until she's on stage in the full get up and just belting out these great show tunes. Mm -hmm. She puts on a hell of a show. Mm. Yeah. She had a very Bette Midler quality to her. Yes, definitely. And then, yeah, I love how she just keeps selling it. And I love (laughs) even at the end when everyone comes out to, listen to Sharon's song. It's like she gets into a fight with the curtain. That keeps... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she did not deserve third place special mention. Absolutely not. No. I don't know what was going on with that. I'm trying to remember who got second place. It wasn't the sisters. And I know the other third places were, it was the... Third place was the disco. The highlights. Yeah. The highlights. There was the highlights and then the Ed Bagley Jr. comedian. He shouldn't have gotten third. Did he get second? No, they had three people for third. Oh. Who got second? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, Fiddler, Fiddler. Oh, that's right. Disco I killer see. guy. Right the TV. Yeah. I guess the results, like they were trying to give people more happy endings instead of worrying about who had the best talent. He didn't cast the right people for the talent, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go ahead and bring up Frank Smith, who is the fiddler who we spend much of the film suspecting, or at least people in the film start suspecting. I think we we're all like, well, you're a red herring. Right. Everyone thinks he's the disco killer, which there are various news reports are a guy who literally just goes in and mows down entire bars and nightclubs, which is a really dark thing to make jokes about. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Uh A serial mass shooter on the loose. Especially in these days. That's a Mm -hmm. tough thing to think about. Did any of you honestly think he was going to be a killer who was just going to mow everyone down? Oh, God, no. I mean, maybe at the very beginning, but yeah, like it was like, no, something else is going on here, obviously. Yeah. Well, given the way Schumacher originally ended Sparkle. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah. You never know. (laughs) I like the twist that the reason he's so suspicious is that he's a homeless dad who's been stealing food from the kitchen for his children. Mm -hmm. And that was nice. And then that he's a genuinely good fiddler and they actually give him work that he can actually play with the band and and maybe even get a local gig out of it. Mm -hmm. Getting into those other third places, we had the highlights, which was the four black women who surprisingly weren't a singing group like in Sparkle. But it was a music group. It was it two saxophonists, a guitarist, and then the one with all the various tambourines on her? Right, right. Mm-hmm. They were a hell of a fun show. Oh, 
definitely. And then I'm wondering, I was trying to look, I cannot find if that's like an actual act that's from Motown mm. Records or not. Yeah, that would make sense. But yeah, I never heard of them before. I, I can find that the individual women are all musicians and musical performers, but I don't know if they were an actual bit. Mm. And then the other placer was Ed Bagley Jr. Mm -hmm. as the stand-up comedian Moss Tillis, who, after an awkward start, tries to break into his experience at Vietnam and drama in the bar ensues. Mm. Yep. His story arc is obviously really closely tied to Letty's mm -hmm. and just that interaction between the two of them and what that brings out in Letty and what that shows about him as well. The two different perceptions of Vietnam and just the way they both approach it. Obviously, they come at it from two very, very different perspectives, but the way they played off one another and just that. I don't want to say it was a mirror, but just the way that their stories crossed and the way it came to that kind of conflict, I really quite enjoyed that. It was a genuinely moving moment, and you got to see a little more into Letty and everything that was going on with her and just her whole backstory and just that one more revelation about her character. Because she was obviously one of the larger arc characters. And all those little bits and pieces, we learn a little bit more about her every single time she's on the screen. And I would argue that she is probably the one we learn the most about in terms of development over the course of the film. Mm -hmm. And I've totally moved away from yeah. <laughs> Well, that's okay. We'll shift to Letty here in just a second. Let me just, Angie, did you have anything else you want to add about Ed Bagley? In terms of a stand-up comedy performance, I think it kind of failed. <laughs> like, you know, he's not a particularly good stand-up comedian. No. But I feel the same way. I think his commentary was very interesting, and I thought it was a really good jumping-off point for Letty, as well as a couple other people in the bar, to sort of all react and show that even, obviously, the war was over at this point, there was still a lot of tension and a lot of opinions on the matter. Still a lot of the fallout from it, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I think his bit at least served a really good purpose and gave the film a really great moment. Yeah, and I agree with that. And then, yeah, to bring up Letty for the listeners she's a woman at the bar she's kind of the debbie downer of the building <laughs> she's always very critical of everyone she's very heavily an alcoholic and mm -hmm. part of her trauma is she lost her son in vietnam and yeah as he's bringing up his experiences criticizing the government in vietnam it's like she sees her son as a hero who died going over there to save things and here's this other guy saying that oh yeah everything just kind of sucked yeah that whole clash between the family of someone who died there and someone who actually was there and stuck there. And it is a fascinating clash of ideals. And then, yeah, you got Cowboy yelling, how dare you say anything, criticizing America and the American government. Mm -hmm. and the, the other guy in the bar, Big Arnold, who's like standing up and saying like, shut up. The way this country works is he gets to say his say, you know? Yeah, let him talk. Yeah. Again, it's like this terrible comedian who just happens to stray <laughs> into a topic that sparks a lot of the tensions that were still going on at the time. Mm -hmm. They didn't really have much else to the Ed Bagley character. No. But that was still an interesting moment because it created a lot of tension and inter-character interaction within the right, bar. Right, right. Angie, what were your thoughts on Letty? She's definitely a very tragic figure. I think when she first shows up, you're not quite sure what's going on there. Obviously, she's an alcoholic, but you don't really know what the cause of it is. And that scene sort of obviously brought up and was like, oh, okay, we can kind of see why she's so angry and why she's got this attitude toward a lot of people. And then, of course, what was his name? The guy who was the judge of the night. Yeah, that was Milt Kavana, played by Henry Gibson. Milt, that was it. She's angry at him because he actually got over his addiction and she's a complex character and she should be really unpleasant, but you still really feel for her and her plight and want her to get better. So I thought it was a really good performance. Yeah. But I agree with you. I think she is definitely, I want to say, one of the deepest character studies that we have in this. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating looking up the actress's career. Cherie North was a big star back in the 50s as basically 20th Century Fox's replacement for Marilyn Monroe. Hmm, okay. Like literally any film that Marilyn Monroe would turn down, they would put her in. And then when Marilyn Monroe died, they put her into a bunch of those. Wow. Huh. But then she pulled out of wanting to just be a carbon copy of Marilyn Monroe and went into TV and had a lot of really interesting character roles. I know she actually had a big recurring role as Lou Grant's girlfriend for a while on Mary Tyler Moore. Okay. And yeah, I think this was a 
really, really captivating performance in character. She actually reminded me a lot of like some of the work that Alice and Janney does nowadays. But yeah, and then Milt, played by Henry Gibson, who interesting because he's primarily a comedian and was doing the Laugh-In series right before this. Mm. A really interesting character of he's kind of this local legend, which is why mm. they always make him the judge at Amateur Night, where he was a singer on all these old albums where he was the backup singer going doobie doobie. <laughs> <laughs> And his career just never really went anywhere. Yeah, he dealt with substance addiction. And he kind of cleaned up, but he doesn't really have anywhere else to go but host the local amateur night. Yeah. But I like the whole bits where everyone is, starts pressuring him from every angle. You know, pick my act and I'll do you a favor. Pick my act and I'll do you a favor. Pick my act or this guy will take you out back and beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just starting to get all this pressure on who to choose and... I like that with Letty, it's not that she gives him advice, but that she gives him the challenge to remind him of what he needs to do when she offers him a drink. Mm -hmm. By setting down that drink that I think he decides, I just got to be honest and pick who won. Yeah. And then the whole end scene where he sees her just absolutely plastered at the wheel of her car <laughs> about to drive home. Right. Like, come on, Mac, you should have taken the keys. I'm just thinking, man, all these people were pretty plastered and drove home. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, then taking the keys and, and driving her home. I thought that was a nice ending for the two. Yeah, it was. Let's get into the two waitresses. We had our first one, Cherie. She has a husband in jail and is debating if she should leave him. And then has the capital letters, nice guy, Harry, mm. who's trying to win her hand and all that stuff and make her leave her husband. Angie, what do you think of Cherie? I mean, really, that whole storyline I could have done without. <laughs> like, it just kind of didn't really go anywhere, you know? It was like, I guess especially since it got introduced at the very beginning of the night, you think it's going to have some importance. And ultimately, it's like, no, my husband's probably never getting out of jail, but I still love him, so I'm going to stay with him. And the guy who's, like, trying to take her away, he doesn't seem like anything special. It's worth it. <laughs> so it's just kind of like, eh, okay, whatever. You know, like, they're there, but not particularly interesting, storyline for me. Yeah, not necessarily the most interesting storyline, but I loved her character and specifically the way she and Marcy interacted. The whole thing with the mood ring and just sort of grabbing it and swallowing it. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> oh, just she was actually a great little character. Yeah, she was obviously dealing with a capital letters nice guy. Definitely there. Like I said, though, I rather liked her personality and just, yeah, particularly the relationship between all three of the women, Fanny, Sherry, and Marcy. It was very much like a mother, older sister, little sister. Yeah. Yes. And I like the performance. Candy Clark, she was a big actress in the 70s, still acts today. She still pops up and stuff. It was an interesting character who is almost that Southern waitress stereotype. Mm -hmm. Always dealing with guys who are chasing her, even though she's got a husband who's locked up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we let go of these terrible men? Because we love them, damn it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's interesting then to see that reflection in Marcy, who is like heads over heels in love with Cowboy. If Harry is capital letters, nice guy. Cowboy is capital letters, toxic masculine. <laughs> yes. I mean, I came up with the metaphor. He'll find a way to use everything as a crutch and then still break it. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, I like that. So, Mac, what did you think about Marcy and Cowboy? God, Marcy was another one of those characters I really, really felt for. I mean, you obviously were watching her and going, oh, sweetie, you could do so much better. Please, no. But especially towards the end, watching her interaction with Cowboy and just sort of seeing that desperation, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, you know, you've got me. You know, that was actually a really well-delivered line, as far as I'm concerned. Probably the best line that her character delivers. And just watching her pine, I mean, that was honestly the majority of her character. But that ending to her little plot line, the actress pulled it off really well. Man, it's like I almost <laughs> related to it more so in my past, obviously. Fortunately, I'm not in that kind of situation anymore. It's that it almost made me angry. <laughs> like, I was like, no, Marcy, you can do so much better than this. Stop it. Stand up for yourself, girl. So, yeah, it was like I felt bad for her, but I also just wanted to shake her and be like, no, no, stop. He's bad. He's bad. <laughs> but she could fix him. Uh, no, you can't. Oh, God. <laughs> you so can't. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> 
that's what I'm saying. It's like I feel that, like, oh, me in yeah. college. No, girl, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then especially that bit when she gets up to sing. Yeah. She's literally singing Let Somebody Love You directly to Cowboy, mm -hmm. who doesn't even notice. Doesn't even pay attention. Until someone points it out to him. Yeah. And even then, he just goes back to laughing and playing pool. Mm-hmm. How much of it is her, like, pining after him and how much of it is just that kind of youthful wanting an experience, mm. wanting something different in life, something exciting and just, hey, he's the most exciting guy here. Yeah, but not in a good way. <laughs> right. Well, and remember, she was also obsessed with her soap operas. Yes. So she had this kind of fantasy about how relationships work. Exactly. Exactly. But I gotta say, my favorite single shot in the movie is the shot of her singing the camera trucking in across the entire length of the bar, going through all the patrons and all the tables and up into a close-up of her. You could have just put some credits over that and released that as a <laughs> teaser trailer. <laughs> that was just such a perfect evocative shot. And that, yeah, that it came from this character who it's like, I had no idea it was such a surprise when suddenly she's the one up on stage singing. Right. Mm. But yeah, that she's a nervous eater. She's got the mood ring. She's <laughs> addicted to the... <laughs> I love when she comes in and they're asking her, what is it, honey? He's got brain cancer. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, this is tragic. And it's like, oh, she's addicted to soap operas. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I love how, yeah, like they don't even react because they're just so used to it by now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was funny. And then Cowboy, played by Don Johnson, and Don Johnson, had, this is already like a decade into his career. He had already been doing some big mm -hmm. roles. And this was six years before Miami Vice. Yeah, which we've now completed the Miami Vice set since yeah. <laughs> his co-star was in Sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a really good performance of a really infuriating character. <laughs> mm -hmm. It very much reminded me of like season one Sawyer from Lost, mm. of like that guy who is so bad and awful, but yet also really sexy to the point that it makes you mad. <laughs> <laughs> like Don Johnson is doing it very, very well here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of those actors you could definitely pull it off. Dennis Quaid is also one of those actors. Mm -hmm. I couldn't remember what the name of the guy is who played his wingman best friend. And so oh. I wasn't able to figure out who that actor was. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah. Because IMDb lists two characters named Roy. Maybe he's the other one. I don't know. Yeah, like it's basically just the cowboy sidekick. And so I don't know which actor is him and which actor was the ventriloquist <laughs> with the horse. <laughs> Because <laughs> I can't find any info on either. Mm. The wingman sidekick, I kind of like that sudden shift where the wingman sidekick was just starting to give him like these odd looks. And I'm mm. like, oh, is he in love with him? <laughs> But then it turned out that, no, it's like this might actually be like his last big night out with his friend before he pulls away, settles down, gets married, kind of leaves the wild boy lifestyle behind. Mm -hmm. Cowboy is like everything is being taken away from this almost stereotypical caricature cowboy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting. Again, Joel Schumacher and his character studies breaking into cultures that he's not a part of because Joel Schumacher, a gay Jewish man from Brooklyn doing a <laughs> Southern country Dixie Bar and Grill setting and just doing these kind of fascinating cultural character studies. Mm -hmm. And then we have the last person working at the bar is, I also didn't get his name, the cook. <laughs> who's basically just always watching cooking shows on TV yeah. <laughs> while Fanny's doing the cooking and then poorly operating the spotlight. Right, right. Yeah, I guess he was just kind of a quick little comic relief now and again. He didn't get to do too much. Yeah, just a little, just a little gag. Yeah, I love the idea that the spotlight is sticking out of the kitchen <laughs> so he can light up the axe while still making food. Not that he actually does so. But he could. <laughs> he could, right. And then getting into some of the other acts... We had the Nutter sisters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the two older ones are just always fighting and trying to upstage one another and the one gets hiccups. Now, what I couldn't figure out is the little girl, is she another sister or is she one of their daughters? I could never figure that out. I got the feeling she was the daughter of the brunette sister, but I could hmm. be wrong. I couldn't tell. No, I was going with the youngest sister, honestly. Okay. That's where I was leaning towards as it went along. It's just such a big age difference there, but I mean, it could be possible. I definitely agree with the MC where he's like, they're the best comedy act. <laughs> Almost definitely. Yeah, especially with the whole hiccups and the one sister trying to constantly block the other. <laughs> And the final quote unquote exit with the blonde just getting her moment in the spotlight by herself. Yeah. And being interrupted by the brunette sister, of course. Yeah. 
And then there was Marvin Laurie, the MC, just basically the mm. flashy asshole in a wonderful checkered shirt. <laughs> Radio DJ. Yeah. You might know him as the voice of. <laughs> Actually, we might know him as the voice of because he did like roles in Animaniacs and Tiny Toons. He is a stand up oh, okay. comedian and a voice actor. <laughs> so, well. <laughs> But I love the whole thing of he's trying to bribe the judge to elect the Nutter sisters just so he can get a date with one of the sisters. And he's doing this whole thing of like, you know, I can get you on air as a radio DJ. Yeah. He's an asshole. Yep. <laughs> Putting it mildly. And then there was the glorious audiences everywhere will know her, Doreen Reese. <laughs> The diva who has this whole big build up with a manager and a bodyguard and a costume designer. and Can't sing. <laughs> she's going to steal the show and she can't do a damn thing. Yep. But not figure out that her dress is falling apart on stage. Right. And I was surprised to see that was the actress who played Pinky Tuscadero, the girlfriend to Fonzie. Oh, okay. And then you yeah, got Jamie Farris, her manager, who's always giving everyone cigars. Yeah. I could not find the actor of the giant muscle that she had. Mm. I want to, to know what that guy's filmography was. <laughs> I'm sure he's got to stand as a tough in the background of various other films, too. He reminded me of Butterfingers from Hudson Hawk. Mm -hmm. And then there was Duke, who was the drag queen in a gorilla suit. It was a teddy bear. It was a teddy bear suit? Because yeah. the song okay. that he's singing is I Wish I Was Your Teddy Bear, which I cannot believe is a real song, but it is. Okay. I did not put two and two together there. I'm just like, okay. Yeah, I had to look because it was one of those things I'm like kind of listening to the lyrics and I'm like, is she saying what I think she said? Like, yes, I wish I was a teddy bear. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I only realized that was the case when I was looking at the soundtrack and looking mm. at the songs and realized, oh God, that was actually a song that exists. <laughs> yep. And again, an interesting character, and we talked about this in Car Wash with Joel mm. Schumacher doing some very early portrayals of queer characters. It's very much of a drag performance where backstage the makeup comes off, just kind of a down-to-earth guy. Right. But constantly getting mocked and insulted by the MC until that bit mm. where he just shoves the MC up against the wall and says, look, one more crack out of you and you're going to be picking up your teeth like guitar picks. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It wasn't quite as good of a comeback as we got in Car Wash, but it was. It no, wasn't a I mean, right. It was a small moment, but it was, I'm sure, like Joel, given his lifestyle, has probably seen lots of people having to deal with that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And it was just his little way of saying, like, hey, these are people too. You may not understand what they're doing, but they're just like everybody else. And again, as strikingly absurd as it was, the drag queen in the teddy bear, <laughs> the gigantic <laughs> puffy teddy bear outfit. Right. Everyone in the audience loved it. So, they, yeah, they loved it. <laughs> It was a fun performance. <laughs> Angie, I'm sure you've had plenty of experience with Jack playing at odd gigs and burlesque shows mm -hmm. and all that stuff. You know, it's like yeah. something can just be kind of strikingly weird at first, but then still be like, hey, that was actually really cool. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So it makes you wonder is like, what was the evolution? Right, right. How did he get of this act? <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. But again, not really built much as a character. No. And then I'm trying to think. The only other characters I can think of were the old man in a wheelchair who's a ventriloquist. Right. Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot to him there. I just kind of mentally put up the backstory that, oh, he's probably an old radio performer who's just living in town. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the baton twirler and then you get like no character to her. No, just a performance that goes on a little too long. Mac, what would you say, like, the overall filmmaking, just the technique and style, the way things are shot and put together? How do you think Joel did with it? Actually, I didn't think it was half bad. I didn't notice anything particularly striking about it, but it wasn't as if it were entirely incompetent. It's not something you can criticize, but it's not something that you would hold up as being the epitome of filmmaking and just sort of something to study as either an example of what not to do or what to do. Like I said, the whole thing I found was rather charming. It was this sweet little film, and I would recommend it, like I said earlier, but it's just that. Yeah, I mean, as far as how it was shot, nothing, you know, amazingly special, but it really shouldn't be. You know, I mean, this is basically highlighting an amateur night performance for the most part and people in a bar. So, you know, I don't have high expectations for it anyway, I guess. But no, I thought it was a good, well-shot film, well-directed. 
Some of the performances, you probably could have cut them a little short, or at least I would have, but we all know how I am with pacing. Mm -hmm. But no, I thought it was very competently done for something so early in his career. Yeah. And how would you like compare this to the work that he had done on Virginia Hill? From what I recall, I think it's a little bit better. I think we're definitely seeing some improvements overall. I mean, not that Virginia Hill was badly shot for the most part, but yeah, I think he's definitely growing a little bit as a filmmaker. Yeah, and I, I agree too. I think he's doing a much cleaner job of building a scene, building... I mean, one of the big things about Virginia Hill was so sparse, and I was curious mm -hmm. with Car Wash, you know, it's a very large ensemble. It's a small location, but there's a lot going on, a lot of people in it. Right. I was curious how he would handle directing something like that, and I thought he did a very good job. You got a good sense of the geography of the location. It never felt like people were just teleporting around the room. He did a very good job <laughs> of knowing how to stage it and how to block out everyone. So it all felt like it was kind of naturally flowing as it's not real time, but it's very much just a few hours condensed down into an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. I thought he did a really, really good job with it. And again, this is his last TV movie before he's going to be jumping into theatrical films. And again, I don't know much of the production on this, but I know this was a very critically well-received movie. Mm, okay. I know it actually got a number of awards huh. and it was based on this TV movie that he started getting theatrical offers. Makes sense. I can see why. And again, a guy who started as a costume designer <laughs> did a terrible little quickie cheap TV movie <laughs> and then became like a pretty significant screenwriter for a while. Mm -hmm. This is not a bad step up into the directing chair for him. I know it's a second film, but I'd say this is our first true Joel Schumacher film. Yeah, I'd agree. Otherwise, I can't really think of anything else. And I, th I think we've all kind of set our final <laughs> thoughts on this one. Right. I mean, I will say that I feel like the more we're discussing it and the more we're going over everything, I think I enjoyed it a little bit more than I initially thought I did. Like I said, it's still not necessarily the kind of film that I usually go to, but for what it was, it was very charming and sweet and entertaining. No, I agree. I think we summed up our thoughts pretty well. Then I just have one last thing to get to, and that is what else aired on that night in January 8th, 1979. <laughs> this aired at... I don't know if this is Central Time or Eastern Time, but you know, you have your three-hour prime time slot. This was right in the middle. So it'd be like 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern. Okay. This aired right after a new episode of Little House on the Prairie on NBC. Well, there you go. That transitioned well. <laughs> oh, yeah. ABC, I don't really have what was airing that night. On ITV, they were playing Feet First, which was an evening soccer program. Okay. And then up on CBS, the beginning of this aired opposite a season seven episode of MASH. Hmm, that's interesting really? with Jamie Farr being yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking that. And that's what's interesting is that Joel Schumacher's first film aired against a season two episode of MASH. Right, right. So I'm guessing MASH was getting a little lower in the ratings, so <laughs> it didn't quite kill this one. <laughs> Virginia right, Hilden. yeah. <laughs> and then for its final hour, it aired against a season two episode of Lou Grant. Hmm. Otherwise, I don't really have much else because again we don't have ratings information going back then right sure but again i know both joel and an interview that i found with laura schuler donner they said that this was a critical success got a lot of great reviews and again got a lot of attention in the industry yeah i mean i think the whole reason it's on her wikipedia page is it did help launch her career as well Honestly, I think it's a film that I would like to see more widely. I would like to see someone actually release a nice DVD with a cleaned up version of it. Yeah. Yeah, the version we all watched was a pretty ruffled VHS version. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Complete with tracking captions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would love to see someone just put this out on like a nice cheap streaming rental or cheap DVD, but maybe mm -hmm. put it in like a box set or something like that. And it's such a strong and varied cast. It'd be interesting to get yeah. the ones who are still alive, like some of their memories or impressions on it too. Yeah. Yeah. Like I would love to hear like Tanya Tucker is still a big country star. I'd love to hear what this was like at this point in her career. Dennis Quaid, mm -hmm. Don Johnson. Yeah. No, I'd spring for a copy of that DVD. Yeah. I think it's an interesting film that is also, as we've all said, charming. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be a fun film that like if you and a loved one just want to tuck in for something nice and charming for the night. Absolutely check it out. And again, I think it's a nice showing of the range that Joel Schumacher has. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like we know his Batman movies and Phantom of the Opera with his over-the-top opulence. We know his more kind of streamlined, gritty thriller type movies. 
And what's, again, been great about the 70s is seeing more his comedies, his dramas. And again, like this and Car Wash are fascinating to see side by side because they're so different yet so structurally the same. Right, right. That ensemble piece. It's a very similar framework, but he did such different things with it. And again, that's why I'm going to be very curious to see DC Cav as well, which he'll be doing in a few years. Right. But yeah, so we'll be back next month as he jumps into theatrical features with the infamous Lily Tomlin's The Incredible Shrinking Woman. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing that one again. Yeah, I've just read the original Richard Matheson novel and boy, will I have things to say. <laughs> So otherwise, I think that wraps up our show for the night. Thank you, as always, Angie. Of course. Thank you. And Mac, it was an absolute pleasure discussing films with you again. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure chatting with you guys, too. And good night, everybody. Good Good night. night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. 